So good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks again for coming to a food policy for breakfast seminar. I want to welcome you to Hunter, Co Hunter College. Mm -hmm. My name is Charles Plack, and I'm the executive director of the New York City Food Policy Center at Hunter College, and also a professor of nutrition here. Um, this particular event is not that they're all not important to me, but they, they're all important to me. But I guess I have a particular sensitivity and um, and feeling toward technology as a way of advancing um, public needs and public interest and public policy and public health. Um, I started in, the, in this in this space, I guess, about 18 years ago, um, and was one of the early adapters in, in, in the, on the web, um, developing entertainment actually on the web, and then moved toward um, toward health, and spent a long time trying to figure out how you can use technology um, for food-related chronic diseases. Um, Probably a little early, but a lot of the work that we you know developed still is um, is is ongoing. Um, we have a very interesting panel today, um, and uh, everybody I, I know on the panel and, and have worked with in some capacity. Um, first, J.P. Pollock, who's a senior researcher in residence at Cornell Tech, and um, he's an expert on a variety of things, including small data. Uh, Benzi Ronan, uh, founder of Pharmago, um, and Samuel Slover. I'm, I'm hatcheting all their last names, by the way, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> and he's the co-founder and CEO of the Sage Project, which is Sage.is, and he has come up with. And they'll all introduce themselves and talk about what they, um, you know, their their involvement and what they do. Um, and uh, Dr. Craig Kadeski, um, who's a patent attorney and. Um, I was able to witness on several panels. Um, he's not just—he's not just a patent attorney. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but he's also an expert in health technology and and, um, and creativity and innovation, which is unusual for an attorney, by the way. And uh, Patrick O'Neill, who's a chief executive officer of Amp Your Good. Um, and first, we're, we're doing a series of food technology, um, basically food technology, food systems food-related chronic diseases. Uh, we're doing a series of papers, or white papers, and we've been working on it um, for a pretty long time, and I think we've got some really interesting things that will help community-based organizations, government, uh, social entrepreneurs, academics, to think about food policy and food technology and how they can intersect. Um, Alyssa Lake, who is here with us today, has been working very hard with the Food Policy Center to develop these series of reports. We'll be releasing the first one on food insecurity and technology uh, probably in the next few days. Um, we're close. It was supposed to be today, but we're, we're, we're taking a step back to make sure it's accurate. And what we've been doing is looking at the cross-section between uh, you know academic information or research that's been done on, on this topic, which is somewhat anemic, as well as uh, examples of you know food technology uh, intersection of food systems um, and and or technology in the intersection of food systems and how they're working to to solve some of these problems that have been ongoing um, and food food I guess food policy in general has been very slow to catch on to some of the technological advancements um, that are occurring in health technology in general. Um, Right in the beginning, I was talking to, to JP, and, um, and we were sort of talking about different things around small data. And one of the things you know, that, that came up is, tangentially is about diabetes and how there's a lot of attention focused on um, food-related chronic disease diabetes. Uh, and there's a lot of work being done in technology to advance that because a lot of, the pharma, it's, a lot of it's driven by pharma. But things like food insecurity and food waste and food safety are not so much, right? Not so much attention being uh, paid to that. And we think that this is, these are areas that are certainly worth discussing, looking at, and thinking about innovative ways to solve these problems. Um, that said, uh, I'd like to introduce Alyssa Link. Um, and she's from NYU, and she's really, she was an expert, and now she's even more of an expert on these topics. And she's going to give a short intro um, about uh, food insecurity and technology and just sort of a preview to the paper that we're going to be uh, sending out to our news newsletter list. All right, thanks so much. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Alyssa Link. Um, I work at NYU's uh, digital solutions team um, as a product manager for mHealth products. Um, and have, as um, Dr. Falcon mentioned, we've been doing a lot of research on this topic. So excited to share a few examples of what we have learned so far. Um, so just a really brief background on food insecurity. Um, it, this really refers to having limitations or uncertainty in having enough food. And that's often clarified by having enough nutritionally adequate and safe food, because those are obviously really important factors. Um, this it, it's quite wide reaching. About one in six Americans are impacted by food insecurity, um, which is 13% of households in the US. And that's about 42 million people and 16 million households. There are some uh, federal programs that have arisen to help um, meet that gap. Um, the most wide reaching of which is the SNAP program, formerly uh, the Food Stamps program, and that stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Program um, Assistance Program and serves over 43 million people, um, giving about an average of $125 per person per month. WIC is for women, infant, and children, um, and that's about 8 million people um, that are, are served by that program. And, and yet, there, these programs don't meet all of the need, and there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that, um, that do work in this area. Some uh, local examples are City Harvest and the Food Bank for NYC. Um, and so I think something that's really interesting to consider is that a lot of people sort of perhaps have a perception um, that low-income populations aren't using tech, but this is really changing and is changing rapidly. 50% um, of U.S. adults with income under $30,000 a year have own a smartphone. And 15% are smartphone dependent, which means a smartphone is actually their only way of accessing the internet. And, and this is becoming more common itself. Um, there are also programs that help people gain access to the internet. So the Lifeline program um, used to cover telephone service and now has been expanded to give a subsidy of $9.25 a month, which can go towards a data plan on your cell phone bill and things like that. Um, and I, I think what's really sort of eye-opening is that despite the fact um, that smartphones are increasingly used um, in these populations, underserved populations are, are really underserved by technology. Um, and so some of the examples that um, I'm going to highlight today are, are speaking some of the early work in this area. So in terms of the, the SNAP and WIC programs, um, there are a few um, apps that have been developed to, to really make it easier for people to use their benefits, um, such as being able to find your balance directly through an app instead of having to call, wait on hold, or you know, press some numbers. Um, this makes it really easy for people if they're you know, at the food store and they want to figure out how much they can afford. Um, another interesting feature is having barcode scanners that will let you know if a product is eligible and then you can even kind of keep the tally going as you're, as you're shopping so you don't get to the register and realize you don't have enough to cover all the products that you planned on buying. Um, and one really interesting example um, in this space is, is the company Propel. Um, and it was founded by former Facebook and Google um, and Apple employees to, to really solve this issue of, of tech for the underserved and, and really trying to focus on the user experience of their products. Um, and an interesting component of that is that when you have people using um, an app that solves a problem for them, for example, checking their EBT balance, you have, in one sense, sort of a captive audience and then can use <coughs> that app to deliver health-promoting content. So um, the Fresh EBT app actually will, will, will target, like, um, coupons for fresh produce and things like that, and they're working with uh, grocers in Brooklyn to, to promote these products and has sort of a new way of, cap of, of a, a reaching this um, captive audience. And other, other apps have focused on nutrition as well as specifically within the WIC program, um, but I think there's a lot more room for improvement with digitized education in general and, and thinking through how we can, you know, again, solve someone's problem, get them using an app, but then use that to, to further promote health behaviors. Um, I'm going to skip that one in the interest of time. So this is um, a really kind of interesting area. It's sort of building on the notion of crowdsourcing. Um, Micro-giving has been a, a, a popular trend in the nonprofit space 
um, to, to really make donations as frictionless as possible, whether that's just adding a dollar on to an existing purchase of something that you're already buying, um, things like rounding up your restaurant bills. So Spare is a company that allows diners that participate in restaurants to round up their bill and then donate that spare change to, um, to anti-hunger groups. So it, it makes it really easy to just give a little extra. You don't really feel the impact on your wallet, but you can actually then track how um, that, that impact grows over time. The, the, in Spare, you'll sort of see this uh, pie graph of showing you how much you've donated over time, which can make you appreciate the impact that, that small um, donations do have. Um, and crowd feeding is, is another really interesting thing. I don't want to steer, steal Patrick's thunder. Um, but Amp Your Good is an example of using an online crowdsourcing platform for food drives. And the ability to do that means that you can actually collect uh, healthier items, fresh produce that won't be sitting in a donation box for weeks at a time. You can actually have people pay for the fresh produce and then deliver it the day that it's needed to a food bank or food pantry. So that is a really great example of being able to sort of capitalize on these crowdsourcing concepts and digitize them um, for, for food drives and things that are already uh, have been you know, in the, the anti-hunger space for a while. Um, and then Tango Tab and ShareBite are, are similar. These actually have restaurants donate their share of the profit. So um, ShareBite works really similarly to Seamless or Delivery.com. You can order uh, delivery or pick up a meal at a restaurant and instead of taking the profits for themselves, they then donate that to City Harvest. Um, and then there are also a lot of examples of social media being used to promote fundraising campaigns or actually to carry out those campaigns themselves. So Feedy is an app that sort of capitalizes on the popular food porn kind of notion. People love posting pictures of food. Um, they love you know, sharing those on social media. And so Feedy is an app that actually with every uh, food picture that you post on the app, you'll donate 25 cents um, to, to an anti-hunger group. Um, Gift and Meal works really similarly. Delete Defeat is kind of an interesting one. This is a campaign by Land Lakes, and they have you delete a food picture on your Instagram page, and then they'll donate um, in, on your behalf, too. <laughs> um, so then another really um, cool example is a peer-to-peer -peer sharing and actually bringing this to a smaller scale. So the Reddit Food Bank um, is a fascinating example. I recommend anyone going home and looking this up because there's really heartwarming stories on there uh, of people who are, are really sort of, you know, in between, they're, they're in a hard, uh, hard time, um, they need a little extra help and, and people can post like an Amazon wish list or a Walmart wish list of products that they need for their families. Um, and then Reddit members will go on and, and say, oh, I just sent you, you know, um, a, a box of peanut butter and, uh, you know, look forward to, you know, hope, hope this helps. Um, it's a really nice example of, of people helping each other out on a small scale and the power of social media to make those connections. Um, this, this is sort of an interesting area because I think if we think about big organiza organizations using software um, and a lot of nonprofit organizations may feel that these big, powerful, big data app, um, analysis software are out of reach for, for a nonprofit, but they actually um, are increasingly offering discounts or even free services for nonprofit organizations. So Tableau is one of the um, sort of most famous big data platforms, really powerful analytics tools. They can create these dashboards and things like that. Um, so Feeding America actually uses Tableau and they had they felt like a grant to, to get set up with it. Um, and the way they can use this, for example, is to see you know, how much does it cost to distribute a thousand pounds of food or um, how much does it cost to source a pound of food and then what, what or what's the inventory turnover in a particular location and having better data on those metrics really helps them to streamline their operations, plan, make better planning, um, and, and help more people. So um, Salesforce is, a, is another example. It's a customer relationship management tool. Um, really, really popular, the leading global CRM platform. And they, they give away their software for free to nonprofits. So they'll give 10 free subscriptions. Um, and again, it's, it's a really helpful way to, to, for nonprofits to streamline uh, their operations and logistics. Um, and then there are some of these that have actually been tailored specifically for, for food banks. So Club Appetite is a Canadian software company. 
Um, and they have sort of a combination of fundraising um, and then allowing people to donate through their, their app as well as the sort of matching supply and demand. So food banks can go in and say, you know, look, we just got um, two trucks load worth of potatoes. Please don't give us any more potatoes. They can say these are the things that we really need and, and that helps to, to create those matches. Um, and on that note, um, we have a, a separate uh, entire white paper coming out on food waste, but I thought it was really important to, to mention it briefly in the context of food insecurity because um, 63 million tons of food are wasted each year in the U.S., um, 52 million of which end up in landfills. And that is, is really a staggering statistic when you think about the number of people who are hungry. And how can we use technology to capture that <coughs> lost and redistribute it in a strategic way. So what the, these, a lot of these companies are sort of using what I would say the Uber model, the, the idea of um, you know, the sharing economy and really matching supply and demand in real time. So what they're able to do is if, for example, a big event or a catering company or restaurant um, has a lot of food left over that they're gonna be throwing away at the end of the night, they can post it to an app and then have um, a, you know, mer pat a, pair them with a nearby truck driver or someone who can pick it up. Um, a lot of the, those truck drivers either work on donation or on volunteer basis or they're you know, already kind of making a similar delivery route and then they can donate to a food pantry or food bank that has a specific need for the, prop, for the items that are um, being donated. Um, and a lot of these apps also help to streamline the tax uh, the donation structure, so making it easier for companies to get um, tax breaks on the donations, and and keeping all those, you know, keeping track of all that information makes it a lot easier um, for for both ends to to recover wasted food. Um, so again, these are just a, a few examples. There's quite a lot of these emerging, especially in this space. This this one's. It has to be really localized because it's you know you're actually connecting physical food to physical locations. Um, so there there's quite a few of these, but that have um, emerged, and I think you know, the the power of these really comes up when as more and more people start to use them, those connections are are able to be made more readily. So um, just sort of a very brief snapshot of some of the um, research that we've been doing over the past few months, and uh, you can read more about it in the upcoming white papers. <laughs> um, and I will turn it back over to the panel here. Thank you so much, and thanks for coming today. <laughs> so, do you have any, have any luck with you? She, she, she had a little bout of food poisoning, and one of the things we were talking about is food safety, and we were wondering, she was like, well, I'm going to actually, even in her sixth state, she was going to she was going to try to see what the um, availability to sort of tweet or talk about social you know food safety on social media we did you have any success yeah so i went to uh, iwaspoison.com and <laughs> was able to log in the restaurant it was actually it was really easy to find it syncs up with google maps so you can start to type in the restaurant you were at um, and then it pulls up the information really quickly you can post a, an infor like information on what you ate um, and then that it's that, again sort of a crowdsourcing method. So you know, if other people got sick from the same restaurant, it helps local agencies to, to act more quickly. Um, and they found that with using social media and, and these sort of you know reporting websites can actually speed up the detection of uh, food poisoning much much faster than traditional surveillance methods. So hopefully no one will get sick there today. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thanks for coming because I know you you were you didn't think you were going to make it. To, uh, you didn't think you were going to make it. Um, I'd like to um, shut this off. Um, if, if we could, start, I'm sure you're much happier. So if you're, I think all your mics are on, the green lights are on there. So just make sure you talk right directly into the mic. Um, and we could, we'd like to start with JP just to talk a little bit about what you're doing, where you, you know, what about Cornell Tech and the great work you guys are up to. So I'm, I'm JP Pollock. I'm a senior researcher in residence at Cornell Tech. And for those of you who don't know, Cornell Tech is Cornell University's tech and entrepreneurship focused campus here in New York City. Uh, we'll be opening our fancy brand new campus. You may have seen it under construction over on Roosevelt Island. Uh, that will be in August. And for the moment, we're sort of borrowing some space from Google down in Chelsea. I'm also the uh, founder of a company called Wellcoin, which is an incentive reward program for healthy behavior. Uh, we work a lot with employers, getting their employees to make healthier food choices, exercise more, uh, prepare themselves a little bit better. We also have a little bit of a consumer focus in places like Boston and New York. 
At Cornell Tech, I'm part of a, a lab called the Small Data Lab, uh, which is basically a place where we look at how we can use digital traces, so the things that you leave behind in your day-to-day -day existence through your mobile phone, or through your use of uh, web browsers, other technology, and use those to do something positive for you instead of just generate ad revenue for Facebook or Google. Um, most of our projects are sort of far ranging, but we do uh, have a pretty substantial focus on health uh, and related to food in particular, a couple that might be of interest. Uh, so one is a project called Pushcart. So the collection of data about what people have been consuming is extremely difficult. That's sort of the, the biggest limiting factor in terms of a lot of what uh, we can do with small data and food. So we thought we'd take a, an approach that's a little bit easier, and that's to gather uh, data about food that you purchase. So using online grocery shopping receipts, your receipts from Seamless, uh, where you go on, uh, where you make reservations at Open Table, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we sort of scrape all of that and put together a picture of the kinds of foods that meeting the profile of that food, and the nutritional composition, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, another is an app called Relish, which we're working in conjunction with a behavioral economist named Dan Ariely down at Duke. And the idea there is basically uh, similar to some of the stuff that uh, Alyssa was talking about to give incentives for people to make healthier purchases at co-ops and local grocery stores as, uh, you know, based, on coupons. based on coupons and pushing out uh, other, other, promotional, uh, other promotional materials around making healthier choices at the grocery store. <laughs> uh, good morning. So my name is Ben C. Ronan, and uh, really coming at this from the software background, that's my career. I'm a product guy. In 2009, I said, with all this technology and the internet booming, there's got to be a way for us to kind of jump the curve and have a better food system. Uh, and so the premise I went into this, and kind of I'll give you the four chat, is so far I think I'm failing, but um, the, the premise I had was, we can use technology to have a decentralized food system that will actually be better than the centralized food system we're currently on. Right? Centralized has a lot of benefits around economies of scale, uh, making food cheaper, more efficient, but we're really paying the price to that kind of a food system when it comes to not eating as healthy or not local or not as fresh or not as nutritious. Uh, we're paying a real price around kind of the sustainability of the agriculture that we have. So the thinking was, we've, we're seeing Uber and Airbnb, where these are incredibly successful companies that are worth tens of billions of dollars. And what they've done is they've basically started to aggregate all of the small players, right? What is Uber doing? They're taking all these independent drivers and then putting an app around it so that they end up, actually end up becoming the largest fleet company in the world. What does Airbnb do? It takes every one of us that can rent an apartment and put kind of a cap over it and then they become larger than any hotel chain possible, right? So technology really has the ability to take a decentralized system and make it more powerful than your centralized system. So the hypothesis I came into the food industry with as a technologist was, could we do the same type of thing to our food system where we take all of these small local farms that are local to us and put some kind of a technology hat on top of it to make it more powerful than our centralized food system? Okay, and I founded Farmigo in 2009 with that uh, hypothesis, raised $26 million um, from the lead investors in the country, so really went at it also thinking business could be a driver of change, right? It doesn't just, the non-for-profits are always doing the right thing, but could we actually make this where it's financially successful for the farmers, um, for companies that are playing in this, and for the consumer? Uh, and it's been about seven years now I'm sure we'll get into it, but uh, so far I'm not succeeding uh, to basically try to take a decentralized system and through technology make it more powerful than the main food system. Uh, I am in touch with all the entrepreneurs that are playing in this space. Um, most of them are not succeeding. We can talk about some of them that are, and I can tell, talk about why I think some of them are, uh, and a little bit more insight into why I think Farmigo so far has not been able to do it. Hey guys, um, so I'm Sam Slover. Uh, so my background is I'm a creative technologist, designer, programmer, um, and I've been really interested for a number of years now on food labeling. Um, specifically, what's the future of food labeling? Um, as a designer, I was always like just super frustrated at the way this information was structured um, for a few reasons. One, uh, traditionally it's just really hard to understand for most people. Two, I find the information that I was getting as an end consumer in this huge food system was rather limited. Um, so this actually first started as a master's thesis at uh, the uh, NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. So 
I just got really, like, I wanted to see what the future food labeling would look like for my own use case. Uh, so I did kind of a weird thing where I, I spent a year tracking and researching everything I purchased from a grocery store. Uh, and it was super tedious. Like, I would literally come home, bag of groceries, sit down, and I, I built this app. And I would look into everything that I bought. Um, and at first, I didn't even really know what I was looking for. Like, I, I was kind of, you know, at this time, this was four or five years ago, uh, my, my whole thing was, okay, what in this information will actually be interesting, will actually be useful? Um, so I started learning about the food system. Um, and I, the first version of this project was for myself. And I always think when you're building technology, that's like the first, that's the best place to start. So solve your own use case, find what's interesting to you. Um, then you, you might find some seeds of something bigger. So after launching that, uh, this actually became a full-on company called Sage Project. So sageproject.com, we're, we're working on the future of food labeling. Uh, we have three kind of core tenets that we're all about. The first one is this issue of transparency. Like, I think it's become this big like, buzzword in the food system. Uh, it turns out like no one in the industry really knows how to do transparency. And as a technologist, what, what we've seen like, first, firsthand is there's not really even like tools to make transparency happen. So we're building a tool set that lets any brand or retailer go in and really explain what their products are, where they come from, what ingredients they're using, why they choose certain ingredients. Um, right now they can go disclose whether or not they would have GMOs, things like that. The, other, the second pillar we're about is personalization. So it turns out that once you get all this information around products, um, it can actually be pretty overwhelming to people. Uh, like you're going from a little bit of information to a lot. What we've seen is key is to give people agency over what information is important to them. So if you're somebody who's diabetic, you might highlight different data points or structure and experience in this app that's different than somebody who cares a lot about environment and GMOs. So we want to give agency to the end user. The third, and this kind of comes from my design background, is really just make it a beautiful, fun, kind of like playful experience. I, I don't think there's a lot of nutrition apps or food data apps where people just like love to use them. I um, mean, that's something we want to kind of change the game on is, is create like a great user experience. Uh, so first and foremost, we're working with Whole Foods to do this across their stores. Um, and yeah, working kind of with, with some big CPGs uh, to move forward and, and really push these issues forward. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Pat O'Neill with uh, Amp Your Good, and I want to ask you all a question. Raise your hand if you ever made a donation to a food drive. Maybe something that looked like this. Okay, so I'm going to guess that really everybody here in the room is familiar with how traditional food drives work. And at Amp Your Good, we've uh, thought a lot about what we call the food drive system, uh, which is characterized by somewhere between 75 and 100 million people who make at least one food donation to a food drive every year. And all that food is uh, uh, going to about 90,000 hunger organizations that are supporting the somewhere between 40 and 50 million people who are food insecure. And there's a number of problems with that system. Uh, probably the biggest problem is that most of the food that gets donated is uh, contraindicated for the people that it's actually supposed to help. Uh, so, you know, highly uh, processed, uh, non perishable foods that are uh, supply, being supplied to a population of people who suffer from very high rates of diet-related health issues. So we developed a different food drive model. Uh, as Alyssa mentioned, it's sort of a crowdsourced model where uh, groups that want to run a food drive, and the kinds of groups that run or sponsor food drives are schools, <coughs> businesses, civic organizations, uh, faith-based organizations. Uh, they use our platform to run their drive and uh, the basic difference that we provide is that uh, groups can run their food drives with the intention of raising healthy food, uh, perishable food, things like fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, non-perishables that are specified by the hunger organizations that these drives are supporting. Uh, we kind of function like a, uh, a wedding registry. And so what we've uh, done is we've taken, um, uh, through this platform, uh, we look at this food drive market, food drive system, that uh, the way it has existed is uh, really data free. Um, and we've added a, an entire layer of data over it to create efficiencies, uh, really with an eye towards making it easier to donate food, making it easier to run a food drive, and most importantly, to get the right kind of food for the people that uh, everybody's trying to help. Craig Kineski, 
I'm a lawyer. Please don't hold that against me. I'm a patent attorney and I lead the intellectual property practice at Wilson Sonsini Goodrich and Rosati in New York. It's a heavily focused life science practice which includes nutrition, veterinary, agriculture, basically anything that makes the world a better place. We work with startups and entrepreneurs who want to change the world and need some legal protection to do so. Even if a venture has its heart in the right place, it is probably going to need some kind of legal protection to move forward. And this is especially true if the venture is rooted in technology. Because if the venture is rooted in technology, then at some point someone is probably going to question where is the value in that technology. And intellectual property is what builds the value of the technology and helps the technology-based venture move forward. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists and thanks for coming from your incredibly busy schedules. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a few questions and I'm going to open up to the audience to ask some questions. And, um, I, guess, I guess the first one is, and it's open to all the panelists, is, is, is about food systems and, and thinking about food systems. Um, why has there been, and again, we talked a little bit about this, JP, but tangentially, uh, there's a lot of people focused on the diabetes space on food-related chronic disease because there's a lot of pharma behind that. What What do you think it would take? And and, and you know, Benzi, you you obviously are thinking about this space as well as as, as Sam and, and Patrick. Um, what would it take to increase food system investment um, in, in technology and related to technology? Specifically, investment. You like investment and development and, and advancement and actually solving problems, so not just investment. So I think first I think success breeds more investment, whether it's financial investment, whether it's people deciding that's where they want to bet their careers, whether it's uh, merger and acquisition activity, and I don't think we've seen much success. Uh, so we, we actually have seen a ton of investment in the last two years, financial investment, which means we have a lot of companies that are able to People, but we're not seeing anybody exit their businesses and we're seeing a lot of businesses that are starting to fold. Um, I think the, the one area where we're starting to see some success is the meal kit companies, um, where they are an industry that didn't exist five years ago is now worth about $6 billion in the United States. Um, so we can talk about that. I think that one is scaling. Um, but most others, um, all of us included I would say, are not close to the trend of success. And is this something that, you, that that it should be government funded, or I mean, are we missing? Is is it not a business? Is it a nonprofit business? Is that what we should believe? Or so I, I think anything that's going to become a legit business that is not kind of a movement and do-gooders, and everybody is here because they believe in the right thing and the right mission. Uh, but anything that's really going to break the barrier and change the existing food system is going to have to make its world into, into the business world. Certainly today, I don't think we can look at governments and say that's our solution, right? It takes a very long time. The farm bill's going nowhere. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so I believe in businesses as a function of change. Uh, and I think if it doesn't come from there, then we're in trouble. That's my perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, a, there's two, two of the bigger challenges. So, you know, assuming you've raised all this money, you've done all this stuff, one challenge is who in the food system is going to pay for these things. And there's competing interest between grocery stores and suppliers and all of these kinds of groups, and not all of them have a ton of money to pay for this sort of stuff. And then on the flip side, if you're trying to push it out to consumers and go consumer-focused, um, you know, consumers have certainly shown a willingness to pay for lots of things related to food and nutrition, but they're, as Sam pointed out, most of these apps are not very fun to use. Uh, they're sort of antithetical to the process of eating and enjoying a good meal. Right? Unless you're taking photos and sending them out to Instagram and getting lots of likes, there's not really a lot of impetus to sit down to your meal, stop, and do a bunch of things. Uh, even if you're trying to go shopping, um, you know, putting barriers to entry on shopping, like creating lists, all of these sorts of things, you know, the longer it takes us, or the longer it takes a person to get through the process of, okay, I want to eat, I want to buy food, I want to do X, Y, and Z, the less likely they are to use these products over the long term. You know, you might be able to get lots of downloads, but that's not really the direction of success. Yeah, the, the other thing I've seen is, um, as Benzie was saying, it's just such a centralized system, uh, a, a kind of a few actors can kind of control a lot of food. Um, and I know for, you know, we, uh, there's a couple of us in the room who went to the program, uh, NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. Um, I'd say some of these like critical issues and critical innovations 
our show in every, we have an end of year show, it's creative technology. There's like five to 10 food systems issues that people are innovating on that get launched every single year. Um, but those groups aren't well connected to people with money and, and people um, who will fund these types of things. Um, and for me, it, you know, I, I think it took a stroke of luck and a lot of resilience to be connected to funding sources, to be connected to kind of the big players in the industry. Um, and so I think more, you know, more that can happen to connect those two groups is something that needs to happen, but it's not something I see a whole lot of. If that happened, we'd be on our way to success? No, not necessarily, but I will say there's a lot of people who I see who are, who are innovating, um, who just are not connected to kind of the more centralized bodies and really have no, like, don't really know how to do it. Anybody who has an awesome idea who thinks I can solve it, I'll connect them to money. Like, I don't think that's the problem at all. So what do you think is a problem, Benzie? I, I think when we look at perishability of food, it is fundamentally different than any other industry that's being disrupted. Um, and every, any entrepreneur, myself included, came into this industry very naive in thinking that we could create kind of marketplace technologies, using the internet to create transparency, to enable these kind of connections to take place. The technology scales, but the food doesn't. Food goes bad in a matter of days, right? And what the highly centralized companies are great at are being efficient at that. Even the meal kit companies that are doing well, they are using the old system of being highly centralized. So they're creating massive warehouses and using the same systems in order to basically get their food out. They're using FedEx, UPS, mass warehouses, sourcing through the traditional food system. Um, but they just have a very innovative way, and I would say it's not usability that's the problem, but, con but consumers want cheaper and more convenient, and that's exactly what they're delivering on. Um, so I, I have not yet seen a decentralized food system that is overcoming those barriers, which is better at doing perishable food, doing it cheaper, and doing it more convenient for the consumer. And the minute we can do all of those together, we will absolutely break the barrier. And any idea, small, whatever, if you can't find funding that's meeting that, I think we'll have no problem getting funding because they'll they'll win. I mean, do you think that I'm going to be Debbie Downer for the <laughs> like I I've, I've done the optimistic side like for seven years. So I for me it's I think part of what you told me to do is take take the rose colored glasses off. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Don't all right, all right. <laughs> but like but like let's be honest with ourselves here because to overcome these things we're going to have to over you know like I'm good at drinking my own Kool Aid and like pitching it. And it, it's not getting us to where we need to be. So, like, I think we need to say the truth for what it is, and and like deal with it. I mean, we're gonna. Find, I'm still here on this panel. Like, I want to solve these problems, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves. And the honesty in your, your mind is that there, there's a big leap to try to decentralize, you know, the way food systems are currently operating to sort of get healthier foods to the, you know, to underserved populations as well as to the general public and safer. That's part of what you're talking about here. We can talk about safety doesn't necessarily correlate with decentralized, right? A lot of centralized systems are safer because you have more, you have safety systems at the bottom points that can ensure that the system is in check. When you decentralize, you add a lot of risk. Um, so I think that also needs to be there. Right. Um, other, other comments on that? Yeah, I think we're still in pretty early days with all this stuff. Um, I, th I think the people who have been in the space uh, working hard, whether it's for the last seven or eight years, uh, I'm in it more, a little more recently. Um, you know, if you think about other industries that have been uh, significantly disrupted, the ones that we are all more familiar with these days, whether driven by Uber or Airbnb, those seem to have happened overnight. But they were uh, changing uh, highly decentralized uh, activities, and uh, you know the centralization of the food system now around uh, the CPG companies and some of the big industrial ag companies makes it a, uh, a much tougher thing to move the dial. Having said that, there's industries that uh, we don't really think of too much uh, anymore because they've changed so much. But uh, you know, people were trying to figure out how to make a cheaper phone call for decades and complaining about the AT and T uh, uh, monopoly. And, and, and AT&T wound up breaking up into seven baby bells and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, after you, you'd call it a, a multi-decade market struggle, change actually occurred very, very quickly. And so all the funding that's been going into the uh, uh, food tech companies and uh, other areas where there's uh, really just a focus on making changes to this uh, food system, um, we're really just a couple of years uh, into that. And it may be that it is just the natural progression of how monopolistic industries change that 
there is this sort of seeding period, maybe maybe five years, maybe ten years of a lot of activity before the stars start to align and you see some breakouts. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a good point. I mean, I think that it's sort of building on the backs of scholars and technologists and innovators. And I, I think, I guess the message I would want to send is to you know, nonprofits like City Harvest and Food Bank of New York and all the others that, that are working, um, you know, day to day, putting in boxes on trucks and things like that, that there might not be a technological solution to, some of, to solve some of these problems. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, maybe there is a connection between, you know, public-private partnerships that, that need to be put in place or to think more about instead of just, you know, green market creating a, um, green market co-creating an app that, you know, lets you see what the daily foods are. Maybe there's a bigger connection there. Maybe there's more of a technological solution of using farmers markets and um, using these current food hubs to sort of deliver better foods to communities. That was a question. <laughs> <laughs> So first I'll say just on the leaps of technology, anybody, I, like, I think we're, all of us here are encouraging entrepreneurs to jump into this space. Um, I think m one of my messages is buckle up because it's going to be a long journey and it's going to be difficult, right? If we just look at Amazon, um, to your point on technology, Amazon Prime didn't really exist as long as four years ago, right? So when we talk about there are overnight successes in technology, today there's like a third <coughs> of the United States that are subscribing to Amazon Prime. Amazon Fresh. Right? Amazon's attempt to try to do fresh has been around for 10 years and they're nowhere near where they want it to be and they've invested billions. Okay, so just like, let's just weigh what overnight successes are and are not. Um, my premise around food hubs is that is an absolute linchpin in how we can have a successful food system. So what is a food hub? Um, you have all these kind of scattered small farms, right? And then you have entrepreneurs that are setting up warehouses to connect the farms to either consumers or to wholesalers. Right, so they're, they're taking on the logistics. Instead of saying to a farm, you do the marketing, you do the logistics, you get it to the customer, um, you hold the inventory. Basically, these entrepreneurs are taking on those pieces that the farms, quite honestly, shouldn't be focusing on because they're great growers. And they're figuring out a very important fundamental piece. There's about 400 food hubs in the United States today. There should be thousands, right? The minute we have thousands of food hubs, I think we start to have a new food system. And if we can get all of these food hubs using all of the technologies that we have on the panel here, better user experience, better transparency, interlinking between the food hubs, marketplaces so that us as consumers and restaurants can see what's available, supply chain systems, Tableau data that, that we were looking at here. Um, once we have all of the small food hubs basically <coughs> playing at the same level as the centralized food systems because the tools have become much cheaper, then I think we start to have a much, a, a huge disruptive movement. It's not one technology, but a group coming together that can actually solve the food system. That's, that's where my hopes lie, and there's a lot of people that need to kind of join to make that happen. Um, so a question for you, Sam. Uh, in, in terms of the SAGE project, and, and we looked at this uh, together with City Harvest and, and um, did a small little pilot, um, and I know that you've sort of talking about using this project and, and using the transparency and more data about food to go to underserved populations. Can you talk about that and, and what your experience is and what your thoughts are? Yeah, totally. I, you know, one of the things um, as a designer at heart, uh, like I'm really into human-centered design, so uh, I kind of hate some of the things I see in the kind of centralized part of the industry, which is really like top-down we think we know how to like this, solve this problem, design the solution. You don't actually talk to the people who you're solving for. Um, so one of our, our big things is we're, we still feel we're at like kind of early, early days of what future food data looks like and how people are gonna access this information, how people are gonna ultimately be able to make decisions on this information. Um, so one of the things we've done a lot of is go sit down with you know target population, people, uh, who have a, first and foremost have an interest in, in making uh, better decisions, we'll start there, um, and figure out what is it that will help you. Um, and not, to, not say that, that we as designers or even dietitians, no, like let's sit down, let's figure it out together. Um, so we did that with City Harvest where we, we worked with one of their groups uh, to say like, what about food is confusing? Um, you're being told all these things, how can we make your life easier? Um, and actually crafted a, a new type of label, a new type of user experience, working directly with the end population. And I think one of the things that was useful is that doesn't happen that much in this field. 
is that kind of empathetic, uh, we don't have all the answers, let's work on this together and let's build something. Um, so yeah, it, it, that, that project was, was really successful and what, uh, one of the things we're looking on now is how we can connect this to SNAP. So uh, for people who are uh, using food stamps, how can we help you make a better decision? Um, and again, we don't purport to know the answers as, as designers, but what we will do is sit down and work with people. And um, I guess this is for, for Craig. Uh, I guess you know you, you touched upon it when you were first talking. Um, what are some of the things that just not not just you know for-profit companies but nonprofits need to be thinking about? I mean, did, should they be if they're working on technological solutions to issues? Should they be talking to a patent attorney if they're developing new technology? If they're working off of even open source data and, and building on platforms? And how do you translate that? And what is you know with limited budgets? Um, just focusing on trying to solve some of these food problems. What what are nonprofits should what should they be focused on in terms of technology? When a nonprofit is seeking a technology solution to a problem, oftentimes the trouble that the nonprofit will run into is just the inability to raise the capital that they need to develop the technology. Because if the technology is going to be developed at the nonprofit, most people are going to look at that and say how is this technology ever going to create value? How is someone going to profit from this? And they're normally not. So the question becomes, where does the nonprofit raise the funding to do that? They may very well be able to find it from benefactors. They may very well be able to get some support from the government. But it's going to go a little bit more slowly if someone does not see the potential profitability of the technology. Contrast that to doing this in a company where profitability is at least potential, if not apparent, that if the product is a success, it will benefit someone financially. Things can move along a lot faster because investors will be interested. They'll want to put money into the company expecting return on the technology. But there's a marriage to be had there. And a lot of not-for-profit companies have actually gone into the business of helping start up little, I won't call them spin-outs because they're not really extruded from the nonprofit, but little for-profit companies that are to some degree financed by the nonprofit and will take in external investment and use the external investment to develop the technology that ultimately came from the nonprofit. So by doing it that way, the nonprofit company can actually access the resources of the venture capital community and develop a product much more quickly because people will see the economic value of it. Now, in addition to that, nonprofits or their for-profit startup partners may also have access to, as opposed to the venture capital community, the venture philanthropy community. And that's a really interesting alternative that I don't think the food and nutrition tech uh, community has tapped into as much as it should try. In the venture philanthropy community, you're dealing with investors who aren't expecting the tremendous fiscal returns on the investment that you would see in a big life science venture capital group. These are groups that are looking to make very sizable investments, not expecting too much return, but will only do so if the company is really going to do something that is good for the world or good for some targeted community. This is a field where that kind of money should become readily available. Right now, I don't think many venture philanthropists are going into food, but that very well could be the future. And on top of that, the small company itself has access to SBIR money, which can further help develop the technology that the nonprofit may very well not have the resources to do so. So the nonprofit can almost act something like a university and be the source of the seminal knowledge that ultimately gets turned out into another entity for development. And by moving the technology into another entity, other forms of money become available and the technology can develop faster. So that's something that a nonprofit can do to get the technology out there faster and have access to a greater source of funding than a typical nonprofit would have just working internally. 
Thank you. And, and actually, just uh, hitting on something you said is about SPIR grants and STTR grants. And that's something that we're, we're actually forming a new center here at Hunter College called the Center for uh, Health Technology and Wellness. And um, I co-founded it with uh, Tracy Dennis, who is a psychologist um, and, and a professor at Hunter College. And we're looking at how we can uh, look at some of it, specifically on health technology, and how we could focus getting government grants for for for-profit businesses. Um, so it just you'll hear more about that. We're gonna have a seminar in the next three months on that. Um, JP, a question for you in terms of small data, and just for understanding small data, we, we were talking about this uh, previously. Um, small data could help potentially predict uh, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, or uh, there's all kinds of usage for small data. You as opposed to Cornell sort of developing the IP and, and, and locking it in, you created an open source platform using small data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, when you think about how small data could be used in these kinds of uh, scenarios, so one of the things, you know, we talked about Uber. Can you just explain small data? Oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So, you know, big data, small data, right? They're, they're not uh, completely antithetical, they're perfectly complementary. one's not better than the other. You know, you imagine big data being EHRs, all the data about where food is moving in the world, and then you imagine small data as all of the stuff that you as one person generate. Um, so we're more interested in building models that are about what are you doing and what can we learn about you from the data that you generate. Um, so not the big picture, but the small picture that's really focused on you. Um, so, you know, in terms of how it can be used in these systems, we talked about uh, Uber and Airbnb, and you could argue that some of the biggest innovation that these companies have made in their spaces is figuring out how to get resources that people have that they would love to get paid for, that are sort of underutilized, and figure out how to get them out to people, right? The corollaries to the food system are pretty obvious, but there's, I think the challenges are bigger, right? Like, for Airbnb, you leave and you leave your key at the door, right? Or you leave your key at some specified location, whatever it might be. For Uber, the guy is just sitting there in his car waiting to pick someone up and you know, didn't happen to have a ride at that moment. But for restaurants or for food systems or for people who have more food than they want, you know, they don't necessarily want someone coming into their house and taking the food away. That's expensive. They're definitely not going to drop it off somewhere and go out of their way to do it. We know that. So it's how do you take that sort of Uber Airbnb model of lowering the barrier to entry to giving away your service and making some money from it, right? So I guess you could imagine small data being a little bit more predictive about when that stuff will become available to help make it as easy as possible to give it away, right? So a restaurant, a given restaurant could be a small data entity and tracking the amount of food that that restaurant is purchasing on a weekly basis and comparing that to the number of diners that are coming in. Uh, you can easily figure out if it's going to be, worth, be a week where they have access or not. Um, from an individual perspective, we can do the same thing. So if you look at, uh, and this is something we've looked at in a different context, but if you look at the amount of times that the person, or the, the amount of food that a person is buying uh, at grocery stores using their credit card, and online using Fresh Direct and whatnot, and then compare that to the number of times that they go out in a week, you can easily tell if they're over-purchasing food and might have some extra stuff. Um, in terms of IP and whatnot, so the way we operate at Cornell Tech is to develop open source technology. So, we would absolutely encourage you as entrepreneurs that if you see some stuff that we're working on that you think is of particular interest, uh, to come and talk to us about, you know, just sort of freely available using it, licensing it, you know, working at developing your own technology stacks off of that stuff. Uh, we build this stuff because we want people to use it, uh, and, you know, if, it, if it's out there helping people, we're better off than, than we are if, you know, we're just sort of trying to like, make a little bit of money on our own with it. Thanks. And, and you know, just... Some of the things that we've been talking about internally are looking at ways to use small data and, and big data and sort of combine the, the two in, in some ways is looking at uh, food insecurity and looking at the way people talk about food. Um, and there's also something called geo-boundarying where you can actually create a boundary around a specific area like East Harlem or even smaller like uh, NYCHA housing and you know scrape publicly available social media data and look for social media, uh, look for hot spotting Right, looking to see whether or not um, there are pockets of food insecurity that need, that need assistance and then you can intervene. But just an innovative way of, of thinking about small and large data to try to do interventions to help people. Right? And I know pharmaceutical companies are doing this specifically. They're creating geo-boundaries around communities, like the hospital communities, and then being able to, um, to scrape the data that's publicly available around social media and I know this might upset certain people in the ACLU is actually looking into uh, stopping it, but right now it's available. So they'll create a geo boundary by the hospital, take the data, scrape it, 
uh, continuously, and then look to talk of what talk is occurring about a specific drug, and then create interventions to stop that, that chatter. Right? Um, but I'm trying to think of ways that we could use this for good, not evil. Yeah, if, you, uh, if you happen to have any connections to Google or Microsoft, uh, looking at Bing and Google search results can be incredibly effective in this way, right? You think about the Google flu tracker, you know, being able to predict where uh, swine flu was going before the CDC could. Um, you look at you know, look for people searching for things related to food insecurity. You know, where do I find food? What's the cheapest food sources? I can get those kinds of things. Uh, you can do a lot with it. Right, and I think that's one of the reasons that um, you know I want to have these kinds of discussions with community-based organizations, policy organizations, and, and academics around food to start thinking about innovative ways around, around these issues. Um, so speaking of innovation and things of that sort, and how, how did you, Patrick, how did you get into trying to think of a new way of, of developing food drives? Because that's kind of a traditional, very traditional, you know, put a bin in a you know, facility and people drop their canned goods in there. Also, a lot of things are inedible. Um, and they don't want, and um, thinking that, oh, poor people eat anything. And you, yeah. know, you sort of came up with an innovative way. Yeah, so uh, I guess a little bit of a, a personal story. I grew up in a um, family restaurant business uh, in northern New Jersey, kind of a rural area. And um, our uh, family restaurant served as the uh, local informal soup kitchen. And so my five brothers and sisters and I, who all worked in the restaurant growing up, uh, help my parents make and uh, sometimes deliver meals to uh, people in our community who were struggling with tough times for one reason or another. And that sort of early experience in um, helping people who were struggling in that way kind of grounded me and, and my interest in hunger just as an underlying issue. Uh, the proximate cause of uh, thinking about food drives were my kids. So uh, my wife and I have four children. And uh, the youngest is now in high school, but uh, you know, four times three years of middle school is 12 years of being a parent of middle schoolers. And middle school is where you first take your health class, which most people uh, remember more as uh, sex ed. But um, uh, usually most health classes have a nutrition week. So our kids are probably like every kid in America who would never talk to their parents about the sex ed that they were learning in, in, in middle school, but they're happy to talk about the nutrition week. And our kids, um, all four of them, uh, as they were going through uh, school, would come home one day with um, their lesson from Nutrition Week, which essentially boiled down to uh, two lists, the list of food that they should eat more of and the list of food that they should eat less of or avoid. And then invariably, a month or two later, the school would have a food drive, and they bring home a list of the stuff that they should bring in for the food drive. It was a pretty close match to the list of things that we should eat less of or not at all. And that was pretty frustrating as a parent. Um, so a couple of years ago, really sort of in the aftermath of the Great Recession, when the number of people who were food insecure really ballooned, uh, it became uh, pretty clear that um, uh, there were a set of interrelated problems. Um, you had a lot of people who needed help, you had a lot of people who wanted uh, to help, but fundamentally uh, the wrong food was being asked for, or, or, or we have all been trained to think of food drives in a particular way. and. Um, I uh, thought there might be a technology-based solution, and so we you know, developed this platform that I talked about uh, a little earlier. Um, if I could just jump, uh, on, uh, go back to uh, nonprofits and technology, because we're a, uh, a technology solution to a problem that uh, hunger organizations have, which, which from their standpoint is really, a lot of people want to help us and support us, but they're giving us the wrong things. Um, one of the challenges that we faced is that, uh, like really all of us as individuals and uh, organizations, we're all uh, flooded with new ways to do old things or new ways to do things we hadn't thought of. You know, we're in this time time period where there's so many new things available. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna guess that most of you, if you uh, took the time to look at your phones and realize that, you know, 50 to 75 percent of the apps you have in your phone, which seem like a good idea at the time, you, you literally never use. So the challenge for hunger organizations is that there is a lot of technology available right now that can help them, but they have limited bandwidth, particularly uh, smaller nonprofit organizations. And so Alyssa uh, highlighted uh, Salesforce as a, as a tool that they make available to nonprofit, all nonprofit organizations, uh, 10 licenses, um, which is 
something that a for-profit business would have to spend uh, five, six, seven thousand dollars for an annual license, and these organizations get it for free, which is great. <clears throat> what they typically don't have the time for, though, is to train the staff and keep up with the changes that Salesforce makes to its software. And that, that's a challenge for organizations. Uh, we talk to a lot of hunger organizations who are shocked to find out that Google will donate $120,000 to them every year. Uh, it's in kind, it's for Google AdWords, but, but we have organizations that we work with who literally don't have the staffing to take advantage of a $120,000 a year grant that Google wants to give to them or would give to them for the purposes of them talking about their mission and creating more awareness and ultimately more donors. Um, I, I recall, uh, and, and this is a problem uh, in, in all parts of the food system, uh, growing up in a restaurant, the most common salesman knocking on the door of our family restaurant was the liquor salesman, the guy who wanted to sell you vodka or the guy that wanted to sell you gin, uh, beer, and whatnot. And I remember my father being inundated with these salesmen, and it was uh, he didn't have enough time to talk to them all. So today, restaurants are inundated with people that want to sell the maps. And I think part of what... Um, is just a reality in the landscape as we think about technology and technology solutions is that we're fundamentally competing for the decision makers time to even pay attention to what our case is and I think those uh, technologies that tend to be adopted or tried are those that have really good user experiences not just for that individual user but for the organization it makes it easier for them to try out and, and start to learn and, and realize that there's benefit that they can continue to invest in this particular one versus the other eight or nine or ten or twenty other things that they're hearing about that week I mean I think that's that's really important to, to understand I mean it, it's we do we do have a lot of there's a lot there's a lot trying for our attention in terms of applications but I think that Narrowly focusing just on apps is, is, is not healthy either. I mean, what what Benzie's company focused on was not apps, and what JP's doing is not apps. So there's lots of expanded ideas around. I know that's not just what you were saying, but there's a lot of expanded ideas around technology that we need to keep open. When we had a forum on urban, you know, ag tech here um, a few like four or five or six weeks ago, and talking about the things that they're doing with vertical farming and hydroponics and things like that, which is also still in its Incredibly early stages where they're just growing, do using it for leafy lean, uh, green leafy vegetable, or green leafy foods, and not you know for root vegetables, and that's not advanced very well. Um, so I think there's a there's a lot of things going on, a lot of things competing for our attention, and focusing on as from a consumer experience, it probably is the most difficult, I, I think, and in, 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 as Sam could probably attest to. Um, in, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. pick back on that yeah. for a second because I, I I agree there's a. A lot of competition for awareness, as, as you're saying. I think one, one of the mistakes that I made was coming in and saying, I'm going to disrupt the existing food system by creating a completely new alternative, right? So a direct to farm to be able to buy all of your food. Uh, and came out, quite honestly, saying supermarkets were going to completely non-exist the way we know them today. Um, and today I look at it and I say, you know what, we have a very efficient food system that's been built over the last 100 years, and supermarkets are the predominant way we buy our food today as, as consumers. Right? In spite of all the technology that's out there, we're, we have not gone direct for perishables. I'm not talking about the Amazon for the non-perishables. And today I spend a lot of time thinking, how do we use the existing food system as a flywheel for the new food system, as opposed to just trying to create a brand new food system kind of and beeline it? Uh, and I think this goes to what you're saying. It's not necessarily going to restaurants or, or, or to consumers and saying, here's a completely way, new way of doing things. But can we piggyback on a way that you're already used to doing things and kind of start inching the innovation from that point? Uh, and so can, for example, supermarkets are not buying from small farms. They're not giving you the online farmer's experience. But can you blend an online farmer's experience with an e-grocer experience that the supermarkets are moving into? Right? Same thing with the restaurants. They're already going through distributors if they can go direct to the farm, great, but you know, there are plenty of entrepreneurs that are looking at how you ride the existing distribution system to actually also latch on direct from the small local farms. I think these are ways of inching without getting the consumer or the buyer to dramatically shift the way they do things, which can be incredibly different, difficult and create a lot of friction. And, then, and that way you start to kind of move the landscape to where we want it to go. Yeah, and for that, I mean, I don't know if this is a great uh, way of looking at it, but Uber didn't reinvent a car, they took existing vehicles and, and just 
the transportation, or they didn't invent taxis. Uh, so it, you also had a specific example about, sort of a micro example about a, sort of a vision of a supermarket that is doing something. There it doesn't exist yet, but your idea of what, what it would look like. So the, the limitation we have with supermarkets, and if we think about supermarkets that are moving on to e-grocers, so basically a supermarket <laughs> says, I'm going to put a e-commerce interface to my supermarket, so you can basically, instead of coming to the supermarket, you can buy what's already in the supermarket. And if you look at um, kind of Instacart, they'll have a shopper that will go around in the supermarket to create your order, and then they'll get it to your doorstep. What we're missing out on is the endless perishable aisle, right? So to not just be limited to the perishables that are in the store, but to give you access to perishables that are in the field, at the farmers, locally, right? The, the fresh stuff. And the supermarkets can't do that because they can't source locally. It's just too difficult for them to have all these individual farmers drive up to the store and drop off their things. So we have an opportunity here with e-commerce to basically allow you to shop at a grocery store and not just see what's in store, but to show what's available in the area. And then partner with these food hubs, kind of these entrepreneurs that are already doing that aggregation locally, and for them to do that last mile to the supermarket. So when you come and pick up your order that you ordered online, you'll get a marriage of what was in store as well as what was sourced locally from that food hub, and you'll be given two bags, right? And it's, it's something that will help the supermarkets increase their basket size, which they're interested in. It will enable them to do perishables, which they're terrible at because they're not set up to do that, and they have a lot of high real estate costs with their store. Um, so it's good for them. It's good for the farmers and the local food hubs, and it's good for you, the consumer, because you're getting better produce at the price that you want in the same way that you're used to buying your things. So that's an example of how, how I think about trying to marry the existing food system that we have with the new one that we want to see kind of grow up. And for there, there has to be a way for everybody to win to do that. Um, it's not easy, and it requires a lot of entrepreneurs to set up these food hubs, and it requires a lot of useful technology to integrate, and it requires the supermarkets to think a little bit differently which they're not used to doing. Um, so it's, it's, it's still a long trek to do. But anybody who can think about how to marry these different systems together and use the existing system as a flywheel to move yours forward, I think will have uh, an inherent advantage uh, in, in their success. And that, was, that was great. And, and speaking of companies like Fresh Direct and, and Amazon Fresh and, and Peapod that are trying to get into the delivery space, one of the things that I had mentioned to, to you, Benzi, and, and to others is that I thought that these companies would sort of eliminate supermarkets in a way, uh, and, and they're not taking up huge percentages, and people still do want to go to you know shopping at local stores, um, which which surprises me to some degree, right? And um, and just as a as an add along, Fresh Direct and and Peapod and, and Amazon uh, Fresh do not take Snap, so for underserved communities, that's not a reality. I mean, they're trying to get that to become a reality, which doesn't make any sense to me why they can't, but right now it's still not possible. So somebody to, to their credit, it's not because they don't want to, right? Yeah, so they definitely want to, yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's the government that's kind of slowing yes. us down on that side. Right. Right. Um, one last question for me, and then I'll leave it to the audience, and if you guys could say a little, a little longer, it would be great. Craig, I, I guess one of the things that, just to, I asked it before, but I want to narrow down on it, is because there are a lot of nonprofits and community-based organizations in the, in the already audience, and is there something specific in terms of IP that they should be paying attention to? Um, should they be worrying about you know paying attention to trademarks? And is there sort of a you know sort of a down and dirty way that they could kind of search for a, to, if, to make sure they're not infringing on a patent and, and search to make sure they're not infringing on a trademark and um, you know get one of these big company letters after you know they spent a long time thinking about them? I just was helping the uh, Department of Health work on a small little project. And one of the things that I naturally do is I'll go and search uh, the trademark database to make sure that these little names that they might be coming up with for the first side project are then not don't have a you know a trademark attached to them. And, and certainly doing that with patents might not be a bad idea too. So trademarks are critical in any industry where the products directly touch the consumer, and food is probably the most prevalent industry in that area. Uh, trademarks are important because when you go to the grocery store, trademarks are how you know the difference between Coke and Pepsi. There are legal mechanisms in place that prevent Coke from calling itself Pepsi, and you know what you're buying. If a company has a good nutritional product, it is really the right thing for them to do to establish a brand 
and develop a name that they can prevent other people from using because rest assured if there's a good product out there that is getting traction in the market and it is no protection for its own identity other people are going to steal that identity and pass off an inferior product with the same name so really if people have advances in nutrition they would do their customers a service to establish and protect their brand name as strongly as they can. Now similarly, of course, they have to avoid other people's brand names. So before anything gets out there, you do need to make sure that you're not treading on someone else's property or, or worse yet, producing a product that will be confused for something that is not as good. Now as far as patenting, patenting is not so prevalent in the food industry but is prevalent in other industries that affect the food industry such as agricultural or veterinary or certain forms of health <laughs> let me give you an example one company I work with they're developing diagnostic methods for determining uh, cow udder diseases and the reason this company is interested in this is because by and large veterinary diagnostics aren't very evolved and the reason they're not is because for the most part animals are given the oldest cheapest generic drugs out there and it's just a lot cheaper to pump an animal full of generic drugs than it is to do a state-of-the-art diagnosis but this is a problem for the food supply because what it does is it puts unnecessary drugs into the dairy supply so the whole purpose of this diagnostic technology is to do a better job of figuring out whether an animal really needs to be pumped full of drugs and stop selling consumers milk that's loaded with drugs that really the consumers don't want to consume. That's the sort of thing, that's an example of a food affecting technology that is really a, a hardcore scientific research problem and need some kind of scientific protection and that's where patents get involved because for this company to use this technology effectively and take it forward they need to make sure that another company can't just step in take it over and in some cases unfortunately not do it as well so for the sake of making sure that the correct version of the diagnostic gets into the market and is able to help people best that's where a patent really should be involved when really the food technology is real laboratory science. Thank you. We have a couple of quick questions. I'm not sure if it's very quick. Hi, Benzie. This is Dennis Derrick from Corbin Hill Food Project. So we've been working with Benzie since 2009. And um, I'm very, I'm actually, I'm very uh, happy to hear you being so open about the successes and the failures. And I really want to kind of probe the successes and the failures because there's so much to deconstruct in this conversation this morning that I'm not quite sure. I do know the conversation was framed around food insecurity, and you're probably the only one gotten out of the box of the food insecurity piece in a purest sense. My sense is that if you create an app, they will follow. And this does not hold true for the, for the underserved communities that I live in. I mean, they say your experience is the experience of Good Eggs with their $28 million of all closed. And so the question really is about when you, define, when you talk about working within underserved communities, uh, whether or not we're thinking of them as being monolithic, or really are they a variety of communities that need to be aggregated together, as opposed to thinking that one app will solve the problem for all. And so the whole question of community organizing, building communities, and building communities that are going to be sustainable, is not really built into many of those apps. The apps are really about individual purchases, uh, aggregation that makes it efficient for you. You take the, you take the case of hubs. When, when both of us started in this business, there probably were less than 100 hubs in the country. There are now 400. And if you go around to the 400, literally less than 1% of them serve low-income communities. And so the reality is that much of this discussion about technology has nothing to do with underserved communities. And until we understand how we define underserved communities, how we frame the questions, where does design research come in, then I think we probably will be having a different kind of conversation around this room. Thank you. Uh, you response? There's a lot there. 
Um, so, as there always is, right? Uh, so first, Corbin Hill is doing something amazing, uh, if anybody doesn't know. They've actually realized that the last miles of the customer uh, can't just be technology, because a lot of these customers don't have phones, don't have even credit cards in which to pay. So Corbin Hill has volunteers in the community that are enabling the acceptance of the money, uh, and then they kind of put that into the system and the orders, uh, and they, they, they do the person-to-person -person connection. Uh, and then Corbin Hill basically uses the Farmigo technology to then link them to the farms to get the food to kind of track everything. Um, I, I think what you have been able to do with Corbin Hill that I, I think is so obvious to you already <coughs> is that we have food deserts where, we, where supermarkets don't find it financially viable to set up a store um, because of the, the real estate itself doesn't have a return on the investment of setting up that infrastructure. Uh, and so what, um, what, what organizations like Corbin Hill are doing are, are they're basically saying, we're going to set up a virtual store. There's not going to be a physical structure that's there that people that need, that need to come in and, and make a purchase. Um, we're going to use our technical te tentacles, which are the volunteers, and we're, we're seeing that there's now more cell phone adoption now in that community. So hopefully in the future they can also use their cell phone technology to place orders. And then the food is delivered just in time based on what was pre-ordered. So you don't have any waste, right? Anything that was ordered, that's what gets delivered to these pre-existing pickup locations. So I think we're using technology now to kind of break through these, these food deserts and set up not stores but virtual stores, which gives us much more access to where the underserved populations are. And I think you guys are a great example of that. Thank you. And I, I, think, that, I think the overall message that, that we wanted to present was that there weren't, we don't have all the solutions to anything. But to try to start to stimulate thinking around some of these concepts and, and think about the problems that your community-based organization or from a policy perspective that, that exists and try to think of technological solutions to don't force the, the thinking, but think about what's available. I mean, just knowing what Patrick said about the Google AdWords, which we're definitely applying for, uh, is, is something that's really important and impressive. We'll take one, one last question and wrap up. Hi, sorry, this one's also for Benzie, or actually everybody. Um, so you said the meal kit business seems to be succeeding, and that's a marriage of technology and old world logistics. Um, why have they succeeded in Farmigo? Had to sort of pivot and change, or like lessen what you're doing. Um, is it just because of money, or investment? So I think what the, what the meal kits have done is they're solving, it goes to the user experience design, both these guys talk about it. Um, the meal kits realize that one of the biggest frictions we have is this effort of what am I going to have for dinner tonight? That's a massive friction that we all deal with, right? We probably prolong that decision until the end of the evening and then what do we have in the kitchen and open up the refrigerator and we're kicking ourselves and it's really painful. Um, and so what they've done is, is that's a huge value that they've taken which is we're going to tell you what you're cooking this week. Um, and then we're also going to make sure that you have exactly what you need to make those meals. So you don't have that moment which is, oh, I need to go to the supermarket to get one more thing and that just killed my meal. And that's a value that we're all willing to pay for, which is very different than whether they're able to get the food cheaper to us or whether they're able to get it to our door. And, and I think that was the aha that, that they solved for. Um, versus Farmigo where we were solving for, you know, we still are with the community, of we're going to get you fresher food, more transparency, hopefully at a, at, a, at a price point that you can compete with. But then we're competing just with grocery stores on price point, where they package it in a very different <coughs> way. And I think that's the breakthrough that they made. Right. And, and not really, it's really for people that can afford it. I mean, it's not the, they're not working toward the underserved community. Right. There's 250 meal kit companies in the United States today, just to be sure. Like, everybody's jumping on this bandwagon, and I'm sure we'll start to see meal kits that are also for the underserved. I think we'll start to see meal kits that are partnerships with health insurance companies that are starting to deliver certain dietary meal kits. Um, then we're also, we've forgotten how to cook in the United States, right? We've skipped that generation. And so there's another value that's happening here, which we're, they're starting to teach us how to cook better. And my hope is that we're, we don't have to be relying on meal kits. At, at a certain point, you reach a certain cooking barrier where you say, I can go source these things myself. Um, but I think we're going to see much more varieties of meal kits. Well, which is really interesting and a good note to end on, which is that you know, here's, a, here's something that was you know, very successful financially. And now, I hate to use the word trickle down, but it, did, it, it hopefully will trickle in, 
to the underserved communities and, and there will be development in those areas because they'll see success in it and see success in people using the, using the materials and the cooking and, and uh, for the supplies and they come with a whole, they'll even come with, some of them come with pans and exactly what to cook in them or they'll, they'll get to that. So, um, that's my idea, I forgot. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank go, you so much for go patent that quickly. Right, <laughs> we're patenting that as we speak. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thanks, JP, Benzies, Sam, Patrick, and Craig for coming. Um, I appreciate it. Um, thanks to Alessina and thanks to Alyssa uh, for uh, all of her amazing work. And um, really, look for these white papers. They're they're really phenomenal, and we spent a fortune time on it. And um, we're hoping that community-based organizations and policymakers and social entrepreneurs appreciate the effort of seeing all these different apps in use um, and what they do and what they can provide and the lessons that they learn. Um, make sure you get them by signing up at nycfoodpolicy.org for our newsletter and for all of our events that we have. Um, the next event that I'll announce, we'll have one in between, but on March 22nd we have the Deputy Commissioner of New York State Water, the Deputy Commissioner for New York City Water, water and um, three ex three other experts talking about how we source and the problems of infrastructure around around water so I think that'll be a very interesting um, event for but that's March 22nd so you can mark your calendar and thank you so much and have a great holiday.